a lot of people just, they want something that they know. I've heard that all my life. Why don't you play something we know? I say, aren't you interested in the adventure of hearing something new and different? Do you buy the same novel all the time and read it? I felt such honor and privilege having this conversation with the great Bert Turetsky. And, you know, this conversation was episode 197 for Contrabass Conversations. By the way, this is Contrabass Conversations. I am your host, Jason Heath. And if my numbering is right, I think this is episode 421 now. So hundreds, literally hundreds of interviews between this original conversation with Bert Turetsky and this From the Archives Best Of episode. And it's interesting to me, I didn't even realize I was doing this, but I put out earlier this week week, Andres Martin, Bert Turetsky, both people involved in contemporary music, writing their own music, and I don't know what that says about me, but those were two of the most interesting conversations I remember having over the past couple of years. And on a personal note, it's fascinating for me to go back and remember what I was doing in my life at the time of doing this conversation. As I was doing it, actually, my wife was in town in Chicago. I was teaching high school in Chicago trying to figure out what the heck I was doing, whether I was going to move out to San Francisco or whether I was going to stay in Chicago and be miserable (laughs) commuting back and forth between the Midwest and the West Coast for four or five plus years and trying to do interviews, which I now do on a daily basis. I mean, my life is so different than when I did this conversation with Bert. I wake up, I schedule, I have the freedom and flexibility. I'm in Mexico right now, passing through San Diego. Maybe I'll even see Bert as I'm putting out this episode. I don't know. But I was scheduling interviews at 4 a.m. before I drove to school to teach. I was scheduling. I remember waking up at 1 a.m. to do an interview before. So I was just doing this insanity. And this was one of the first episodes coming back. I mean, it was 197 where I really did my research. And now that's what I do because I have the time and the flexibility to do that. I sit down and I read everything about a person. I listen to everything that they did. And with this interview with Bert, I bought his book. I read his book, A Different View, his autobiography, which you should totally read and pick up a copy. There are links in the show notes. And I got to really go deep with Bert. I mean, someone whose breadth of knowledge and wealth of experience, that's the way to approach doing an interview with somebody like Bert. And I've spent a lot of time since this interview with Bert talking to musical entrepreneurs, and it occurred to me as I was thinking about what to put out for these couple weeks of greatest hits. You know, Bert is kind of one of the OG double bass entrepreneurs, really sticking to his vision of what he wanted his career to look like and how he wanted to express himself musically, artistically. I just can't say enough good things about Bert, and it really was a privilege to sit down and chat with one of the most influential double bassists, composers, musical entrepreneurs, you name it, of the 20th and now 21st century. Here is my conversation with Bert Turetsky. And maybe just we could start by talking a little about what sure. inspired you to write the memoir. Okay. Well, one day I got a letter and the address said JC in Jerusalem. So I figured, well, this is uh, a joke. This is um, right. a prank, and somebody is messing with me. So I thought, well, okay, let's open it up and see what's up. I opened it up, and it was from a bass player in Jerusalem whose name was J.C. Jones. He's a French, uh, I think he was born in Algiers, so it's probably Honus originally, you know, mm-hmm. the J equals H. Anyway, he's an improviser, and he liked my work very much. And he has a, uh, or had, a company that put out records, CDs, and uh, he wanted to put out a series of books. And uh, he wanted me to do a memoir, because he thought my story was important. So I um, wrote back and I asked him about it, what he wanted, and he told me that his format, and I had recently retired from the University of California, 
So I began to come into my studio five mornings a week and start the day writing. So uh, that's what I did. I came out and I wrote uh, five mornings a week. Uh, why did I do it? Because a lot of people didn't know my story. One of my uh, most brilliant former students had no idea. In fact, my old friend Frank Proto had no idea what I did coming up. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought it was important to get the story out and thank all the composers who wrote music for me that made it possible to have a solo career and all that stuff. Well, it's really fortunate that you documented these early years. I mean, I love reading through and you've got the various letters and you've got old programs yeah. and that that's uh, it's really good that you saved all of that material. Did you uh, did you have help with that when you were at UCSD? Did they help uh, with that, keeping no. all those old programs? That's all you. Okay. No, no. Well, it's me and my wife. Right. Sure. My wife is a collector. In fact, she collects an awful lot of stuff that I could do without, but okay. Uh, uh, happy wife, happy life. Right. Uh, so uh, we'd play a concert and she'd say, uh, give me a copy of the program there. And she'd put it in a book. As we got older, she was less uh, compulsive about it or less organized about it. But I try to keep a lot of the programs and the letters. I must say, I, I wrote a lot of letters, still write letters, mm -hmm. and uh, she wrote a lot of letters. We got married in 1959, and we're still married. So for a musician, two musicians, that's amazing. Uh, you know, with, yeah. without uh, fear of contradiction, I say that. Right. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I kept a lot of letters. I've missed some of them, but we have... Um, one of those uh, storage spaces, and I think there's a lot of stuff there that I'm going to get to probably in April. I have, still have concerts, and I'm working on a third book now, so uh, I'll get to that. But you got to have documentation if people say you did this and you did that, and someone says, really? And then you you look at the letters and you look at the programs and you say, Damn, that guy did it. <laughs> you know, Frank Proto, who's an old friend, Frank said, I didn't know you. You know, you played in bands and you played jazz and you played ethnic music. You played with a Greek band and you did that and this and that. I say, well, Frank, uh, I did. You know, I, I've lost one book with pictures and we're, we're looking for it, but you haven't seen my studio and um, there's an awful lot of books and music that I've collected over the years. So uh, it's easy to lose something like that. But I will find it ultimately because I'm uh, tenacious. <laughs> All right. It's 2017, Jason, again, and I'd like to take a moment and thank our sponsors. And we have a new sponsor, Robertson and Sons Violin Shop in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And certainly you are aware and have heard of Robertson's for more than four decades, four decades. They have been in business providing the highest quality stringed instruments, not only basses, but violins, violas, and cellos, but of course, basses and bows. They have been connecting musicians, collectors, music educators, students of all ages. And my wife is from Albuquerque, and I had the privilege of going and spending a basically an entire day at Robertson's and playing their basses. What a fantastic collection. I highly recommend going to Albuquerque if you can. It's very easy to get to. Beautiful place, wonderful part of the country. And what a fantastic collection. Just first class in every sense of the word. They have a recital hall, Robertson Recital Hall, in the shop, connected to the shop. It is a beautiful place to not only take in an event, but to try out instruments. I was playing some of these fantastic basses that they have in their collection. I was playing, and then Aaron Robertson, 
he was playing the basses and I got a chance to go out and listen in the hall. How fantastic. As we were playing, my wife and my father-in-law, my father-in-law is a bass player, by the way, they both came and they were listening and their jaws were on the floor with the sound of these basses we were trying out. I highly recommend checking out robertsonviolins.com. And it's great to have you on board with Contrabass Conversations. All right, we're going back to our conversation with the great Bert Turetsky. I love reading through all these all these letters and uh, you, the the Marx. Is it Joseph Marx? The, Joseph. the Joseph Marx. I love yeah. it. He's like talking about you as a promoter, entrepreneur, manager. You're like awe inspiring yeah. and terrible, which is a fantastic. <laughs> um, Isn't that wonderful? To, yeah, yeah. He was he was a brilliant man. And uh, he was a major in Romance Languages, the University of Cincinnati, as a young man. And uh, so he had a way with words. He could be uh, just charming, and he could be devastating. I mean, you know, and that letter went to the University of California, who was thinking of hiring me. (laughs) (laughs) But they hired me, uh, you know, despite uh, those few words. And one one thing that's that's interesting is not only were you the bass professor at UCSD, but you were a professor of music, not just of bass. Okay, right? yeah. I, I'm so happy that you brought that up. Yeah. Um, in the book, I mentioned Joseph Iadoni, the lutenist that I studied with. Mm-hmm. So, when I was getting time to graduate from the music school in Hartford, uh, Joe Iadoni said. Uh, Let's go to New York and we'll talk to Sidney Beck, who is a musicologist uh, at the New York Public Library. And so he'll give you some advice. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay. And we went and Sidney said, well, w- w- what are you going to do? I said, well, I'd like to get teach. And he said, great. But if you're only going to teach an instrument, you'll probably be adjunct part-time. But... Uh, is there an area that you're interested in? I said, well, music, co- music history, musicology. Uh, I'm not a theoretician. And then I wasn't a composer. Now I'm, I'm probably a poser, composer. <laughs> I, I write these little short miniatures, and sometimes with some improvisation in the middle, they come out to be, you know, uh, fairly standard length pieces. Mm-hmm. So... Um, I said musicology, so he said you should go to New York University and study with Kurt Zox and Gustav Ries. Zox was very old then and uh, was a major figure in the building up of uh, music history and musicology as a an area that one would study. And so I had uh, two or three semesters with him before he passed on. And so I, I taught these other classes because then I could be a professor, but at the University of California, they do not hire someone who's just an instrumentalist. I don't say just uh, with, with um, you know, sarcasm or snark. I say they need people who can teach classes. Otherwise, I mean, you look at it from a cost-benefit relationship, which I, I just learned this concept, I'm not a business person. Uh, if you're paying a person X thousand dollars and they teach three students, you know, that's not so good. Right. But if you have somebody who teaches classes with 80 and 60 and 50, well, there's some money from the students coming in to pay your salary. And uh, so that's how, that's the thinking so, yeah, I taught music history. I started the jazz program there. I taught the history of the symphony. I taught uh, Renaissance music. And I co-taught a, a wonderful class with the poet Jerome Rothenberg. It was like words and music mm-hmm. or words and uh, sound. Mm-hmm. And we had, uh, you know, poets in there and improvisers in there. And it was a hell of a class. I talk about it in the yeah. book. So in other words, they, I was versatile, and uh, they got their dollar value, the university, out of me. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had a lot of base students, and some of them 
as you know, Jason, have become famous. It's fascinating to read through and just like the influence. Obviously, I think what you're best known for is the 300 plus compositions that you've Mm -hmm. contributed. Yeah, it's just so interesting to follow along with the various phases of your career. I love you just mentioned the poetry and teaching the class on poetry. I, I love the exploration of music and poetry that you did. Just maybe talk a bit about how you got started with uh, okay. incorporating that. Sure. I grew up in Connecticut, and in New England, they have the blue laws, some of the states. You know what they are? They're, they're a holdover from the pilgrim days. Mm. Mm-hmm. So you couldn't drink in Connecticut on Sunday until midnight. So in other words, it was Monday. And kids would go across the border to Massachusetts, which was more lenient. Mm-hmm. And so um, I couldn't play in, in clubs uh, when I was underage, under 21. Well, of course, I was playing in clubs nice. before I was 21. Nice. So what they would do, um, they'd put the bass in the back of the piano so they couldn't really get a good look at me. And um, they'd be a a band room, which was really a broom closet. And uh, the the lighting was pretty good. So they say, look, Bert, you go in the band room and hang out and we'll get you after the intermission is over and we'll play. So I said, okay. So I started to read and I started to read because of the length of time of the intermission. Uh, I started to read short stories and poetry. And I really liked it. And I was a voracious reader anyway because I was a very asthmatic when I was a kid and I spent a lot of time, you know, in hospitals and stuff. So I, I was a fast reader mm-hmm. and a good reader. So I'm trying to think of when the first time, I don't remember exactly. Someone, hmm, it could have been with Jerome Rothenberg, who I've worked on and off with for over 20 years. And um, I heard music. I mean, I no no joke. I would read a poem and I'd hear music. It's like when we read a novel and you can almost see people, mm-hmm. like a film. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know that? Yeah. It's yeah. Very, no, I, I know that feeling. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was the same with me with melodies, and um, I did something with David Osman from San Francisco who was in the Fire Sign Theater, and uh, he sent some poems, and I recorded a track here at the local radio station, and I did, started to find it fascinating, and now I work with uh, Chuck Perrin, uh, P-E-R-R-I-N, there's our pictures of Chuck in the book, Mm -hmm. and... um, we can you can check it out on uh, YouTube, and uh, it's bass and voice. That's what he calls it, bass and voice. And there's some cuts uh, of us doing pieces, including um, the Frank Proto's piece uh, about Mingus. Mm-hmm. But I just found it fascinating, and I've collaborated with a lot of people. In fact, yesterday afternoon I did a two of my pieces. One was uh, Neruda. The poetry was by David Henderson, a distinguished African-American poet, lives in New York City in Berkeley, who I lived in those two places. And and then a Kerouac a piece from the uh, Mexico City Blues. It's called uh, Dead Belly, which is about lead belly. Oh, cool. Yeah, and the audience just cracked up. They just loved the pieces, and I, you know, we played in a in a library, beautiful library downtown San Diego. And you get people who have, you know, older people and some younger people who have nothing to do and can afford to go to a free concert, and uh, a beautiful auditorium. Anyways, those pieces went over very well with me, Jason. I. Uh, as a kid, I played with two other rascals from high school, and we we once played for a kid who had a terminal disease, and we were pretty funny. Well, there was another, the third guy in the trio who was really funny, and they he they laughed. The kid laughed. Uh-huh. The dying kid laughed, and I thought, well, 
this maybe is an interesting uh, avenue to consider uh, as a career. Uh, make people happy. Um, that would be good. So you, you haven't been to a Turetsky concert. I I have only been the I think the only time I've seen you live was at at Northwestern uh, sometime in the nineties I think you oh came through God. so but I remember I remember you were playing and and is talking about the few different so it was all solo bass pieces it was informal yeah. but I think that's the only time okay I I think I remember that a little bit but at a concert I I just you know have fun mm-hmm. and. Um, People uh, comment. I mean, the Europeans, when we first started to play in Europe, they said, you look like you're enjoying yourself. I said, why the hell would I carry an instrument this big if I didn't enjoy, you know, playing music on it? Mm -hmm. It's just silly. And uh, my brother uh, went to MIT. He's the smart one. But I could have (laughs) chosen a profession uh, other than, but this, I, I feel that uh, I brought some joy to some people, and I've, I've uh, brought a lot of angst to other people who just felt, oh my God, uh, the uh, status quo is being challenged by this crazy man, <laughs> and you know that I'm not crazy. I am not crazy. I'm an educated musician who uh, has a good historical uh, basis for what he does. And I have a commitment to uh, American music and American composers. I I wrote about my classmate who committed suicide because no one wanted to play his music. Mm-hmm. That disturbed me deeply. I still remember it. I remember the first day I walked over and met Nick. And uh, it annoys me that people are afraid of American music, especially Americans. It, it bothers me that people think music ended with, uh, you know, Brahms or Beethoven. And uh, so yesterday we played, uh, started with medieval music. And, um, and then we did, I did those two poems. And then we did a piece of mine called Pacific Parables, which is sort of a... Um, Oh, a platform for improv, uh, cello, bass, and flutes. And it was all basically on an e, a scale on E, almost pentatonic, mostly pentatonic. It had that Asian vibe, you know, Pacific mm-hmm. Rim vibe. And what else? And then I played a piece mo- mostly in harmonics by a New York composer, young woman, and then we finish with a medley of Duke Ellington uh, tunes that I arranged. Oh, we also did a Richard Felciano a Spectra, which I've mentioned in the book and we recorded. So, um, you know, that's a, a heady program. Yeah. And a lot of people just, they don't want that. They want something that they know. You know, I've I've heard that all my life. Why don't you play something we know? I say, aren't you interested in the adventure of hearing something new and different? Do you buy the same novel all the time and read it? Right. Come on, guys. Open up your ears, open up your minds, and open up your hearts. Very important. Well, I love... Um, the- I love how you talk about you talk about the tuxedo guys and how in the book I think is that the term yeah. you use and you start to uh, just leave the formal tradition even like even in terms of dress the visual aspects of the concert you started to yeah. play with and then also just uh, connecting with the audience and uh, uh-huh. talking talk communicating between the audience and the artist I I just I love that really resonates with me good good. Uh, Look, you. I went to see Miles years ago in New York. He came out, he had his back to the audience, didn't say a word, didn't talk to anybody on the stage. And when he finished his couple choruses, he walked off to the side and trained, played some for a while and, and so on. Uh, I didn't like that. Uh, I, uh, I like Duke Ellington. Of course, I'm an Ellington uh, guy. 
and he would come out and he'd say these things like, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, so-and-so, and he's the most magnificent uh, practitioner of such and such and such. In other words, uh, with Duke's case, a lot of it was bullshit. Right. I mean, let's be clear about it. But it was so charming that everybody liked it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what Duke would do when somebody was uh, screwing up and maybe drunk for a couple of days at a time, He'd uh, introduce them to the audience, and he'd say, uh, the great Cootie Williams. And Cootie had been drunk for three days, and uh, he'd call a tune that they hadn't played for months. And there would be Cootie Williams walking to the front of the orchestra and being uh, in charge of this tune. And that sobered him up pretty fast. Yeah, I'll bet. A friend of mine spent time with them in, when the Ellington Band was in Las Vegas years ago, and he said he always did that. He would embarrass you, you just so that you would just get stone sober quick. And um, I always got a kick out of that and his eloquence, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. And just don't forget that we love you madly. He always said that, and um, he he. Um, really connected with an audience and uh, I thought it was very good but I have to blame my father I don't know if you have to blame your father for anything but uh, I hope it's positive <laughs> now my father would wake up in the morning uh, he had a business uh, not a good one but uh, one that was just next door he had a, what they used to call a gas station years ago and it, he was in Connecticut, and there was an ice house, and my brother and I would cut, cut ice and carry it out to the customers uh, before the fridge came in. And um, my father would wake up at every time, and he'd start talking. Mm-hmm. And my father would talk the whole day through until the dear guy went to sleep at night. My brother can talk. My two sons can talk. One of them is a, a p- political science professor, and the other one is a, an executive with Skechers shoes. So, I mean, uh, Jerry, the older one, the, the salesman, the shoe man, he can really sell shoes. <laughs> I mean, he's got a serious <laughs> job. But it all goes back to my dad, who was a talking machine. And, you know, I was paid many years to lecture. Mm-hmm. When I left the uh, the University of Hartford, I pointed out to the director, I wanted a, a raise, uh, Jason, mm-hmm. don't we all? Right. And, and so I said, well, before I teach one base student, I've earned X dollars, and uh, that's uh, even more than you want to pay me. So, of course, I left. But um, that was important to have this ability to feel comfortable and uh, go on and talk. I think there's a review or a letter about when I first played at the kitchen in New York. Uh, I'm feeling very comfortable uh, in my own skin and, uh, uh, you know, uh, charmed uh, the the people at the kitchen. Because a lot of people come out, and especially in new music or improvisational music or free music, whatever you want to call it, and they come out and they walk out and they look at the audience and they they sort of um, suggest that here I am, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna play music and if you don't like it, too bad. Uh, but it's gonna be good. Or we bring you the truth, <laughs> especially the new music people used to come out like that in New York. You know, yeah. Think about we bring you the truth. Oh really? Come on, guys. Uh, if they're not coming to your concerts, you're not playing concerts. And if composers don't write music, some of you people wouldn't be working. So be good to them, for God's sakes. Uh, anyway. I love that. That's something that you convey in, in the book. Like When people like you, they'll come to your yeah. concerts. And if they don't right. like you, they, they won't come. And I like the idea of just... You talk about how you are the marketing person. You are making the decisions. You pick the pieces. And right. I think you have the line, uh, you may not like all the pieces I'm playing, but I believe in them. And I think that that's, that's just well, that's uh, it. Yeah. That's it. You're a smart guy. That was one of the big things. People knew 
that I was serious about it. I wasn't doing it because you got to play a contemporary piece in the mm -hmm. concert or else you won't get the degree. Uh, one of the big studio players in L.A., a uh, very fine bass player and a good jazz player, really good jazz player, and a friend, um, he once said to me, we're at a festival uh, in Europe, and I had played a, a oh, very complicated piece, and I didn't like it, but I believed it was a good piece. And anyways, he came up to me and he said, Bert, he said, I love you. He said, you're the only guy who can make music out of this shit. <laughs> and uh, we both laughed. <laughs> and uh, I do believe in the pieces I play. And if, and, if they're, and if I don't like them, I, Jason, I, you know, if they wrote them for me, I'll do a premiere and maybe a couple of performances and I'll let them go into the circular file. Mm -hmm. But you got to give it a chance. And when you believe in something, even if it's really radical, hard to listen to, uh, people say, my God, he's living this piece. He's inhabiting this music. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's give it a chance. And sometimes uh, this happens and the audience really likes it. And uh, that's important because if I don't have success as a soloist with this ingrate instrument, uh, a lot of people are going to have trouble, um, you know, uh, themselves. But someone will say, well, I heard Turetsky play and gee, I loved it. And the audience seemed to love it. And, uh, look what happened when he plays in Europe and all that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm opening doors for a lot of you guys, you know, and uh, well, someone would say, well, I mean a bass recital. Yeah. One of my friends in Bert Turetsky has been doing it for 30, 40 years. Really? Yeah. Look at this. Look at these recordings. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll give you a chance. Sure. What the hell? There's a precedent for it. Yeah, there is a precedent for it, but it takes uh, balls. Yeah. It takes a uh, commitment to do it. Um, in 1964, Oh, you're in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what you'll do uh, later today is leave your address, and I'll send you some CDs. Uh, you can give a listen to some of the music I talk about. Yeah, that'd be great. But my debut recording in 1964. 1964, oh my goodness. Wow. I played in New York City, and uh, I played all pieces written for me. And... Uh, some people said, what? No Bottasini, no Dragonetti, no this, no that? No. And uh, in the book I wrote that, I, I decided that it was going to be the music that gave me what kind of, what little bit of a career I had before the New York show. And I had to be, they were true to me, and I had to be true to them. I had some children, and I didn't have money, but they knew if they wrote a piece for me, they'd get performed and perhaps recorded. And that was the deal. So I had to find things in this wonderful instrument uh, that some people may not have done before. And to fascinate the composer, in fact, to seduce them into writing a piece for me without $3,000, which I didn't have and don't have now. You know, yeah. So, so that was the, the impetus toward uh, experimentation and timbre and everything. I was naturally curious, but um, if a composer came over and said, "Well, what can you do on that instrument that uh, you know uh, the cello can't do?" For example, that was a question, and I'd show them, and they'd say, "Oh my God, <laughs> this is cool." And you look at the George Pearl piece, and he he was a big 12-tone guy and a theory guy, and he wrote a piece with all kinds of coloristic things, and he just loved it. So, um, you know, you have to show the composer that it's a, it is a solo instrument, and I call it the most versatile string instrument, bowed string instrument in uh, Western culture. And people say, oh, my God, those 
a mighty big words. Mm-hmm. I say, uh, come over the house and or come over to the studio and I'll show you. Can you do this on the violin? No. Can you do this on the cello? No. Oh, hmm. It's 2017, Jason, again, and I'd like to give a shout out to our other sponsors, and I'm just so appreciative of these folks being on board with the vision of this podcast and what this is, and they're the folks that keep the lights on here and allow me to have conversations like this on a weekly and frequently daily basis that I get to then put out to the world. So thank you so much to the Upton Bass String Instrument Company. Love Upton, and I love their car model Upton double bass. It's the only commercially made double bass that Gary Carr himself, the great Gary Carr, endorses. I've had Gary Carr on the podcast, by the way. If you haven't checked that out, that's a must listen. I'm only not putting that out in the best of because it's so recent, but Contrabass Conversation slash Gary Carr. And this car model bass, it's got a great combination of comfort and tone. It's gained a loyal following with not only classical players, but jazz and roots players and the car neck slim long car neck has become a favorite for crossover electric bass players very cool so many folks own upton basses play upton basses and you're going to be hearing several interviews coming up with upton artists love it check them out uptonbass.com And thank you to the Bass Violin Shop. They are in North Carolina, and they offer the Southeast's largest inventory of basses. That's laminate basses, hybrid basses, carved double basses, whatever your needs are, whatever you're looking for, entry-level bass, laminate bass, or a fine top-level pedigree instrument, check out BassViolinShop.com. Thank you also, Emilio Gorino, former podcast guest, and his chromatic end pin. I look to my left. I have my chromatic end pin right here sitting on top of my base case. I have been loving this, and it's my first experimentation with an angled end pin. So a straight end pin only lets you balance the base in one way, right? The chromatic end pin is totally customizable in terms of angle in every which way or form you really need to check it out online to see what I'm talking about the chromatic but you can customize the feel and the angle for sitting for standing when you balance with the bass with a chromatic end pin you're never going to want to go back the instrument feels lighter it's easier to hold it's a great way to experiment with angled end pins which are so popular these days without drilling your base give it a shot and if you're traveling it's a great way to get that feel that you're accustomed to if you do play an angled end pin without having to have the specific labry setup for a base that you're picking up you know so frequently you get a straight end pin base you play an angled end pin it's kind of a problem so the chromatic end pin solves that problem for anybody who is using an angled end pin or is curious about experimenting. Check out the chromatic end pin dot com. All right. Back to our conversation with the one, the only, the wonderful legend, Bert Turetsky. I love that. Edu- the, just you've done so much to educate the composers and just show all those. And I love that. I, I, I remember reading that in the book, just the range of the bass. You can't it's right. from the lowest, lowest tones up to the highest harmonics. It's just incredible. And the bass as a percussion instrument and all the all the timbres that you can get out of it it's yeah. w- was the contemporary contrabass was your first book was, did was you, um, yeah yeah did you write that to to help educate composers uh, yeah absolutely yeah and i wanted to educate bass players and mm-hmm. they say well you know something jason if you if you do, uh, write something and it's printed it has immediate credibility mm-hmm but if you just type it out and share it with some people, nothing. Unless people are educated and smart and interested. But uh, when you have it published, oh boy, the doors open. Mm-hmm. So the contemporary contrabass was uh, in a, a, really a revolutionary book. I, I, I know that to be true because I've studied music history all my life. And a lot of people... Uh, learn things from there. One of the problems with the book is they didn't, the first edition, second edition is, is clear and, and uh, I, I think I, yeah, I wrote about the problem. The first book, a lot of edition, a lot of people would say, oh man, that's cool, I could do that, I could do this. And they'd write sort of a bland, colorless piece. Mm-hmm. 
And then they'd take the book and look and see how they can put a little rouge over here and some lipstick over <laughs> here. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. Exactly. And dress it up. Instead of having those timbers as an integral, organic part of the piece. That's what I want. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, that's important to me. Very important. Yeah, it's like you were showing you were showing people some possible ways to explore sound, and then they they yes. just said, "Oh, great! I'll just assemble a piece like a jigsaw puzzle of those those teams." Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or write a bland piece and they use some of these things mm-hmm. and call them tricks. I call them techniques. Yeah. But some of them just thought it was like a makeup kit, and uh, you know, gussy up the old girl and take her into town. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's something you describe, and it's something that I've encountered a lot. Of, you're just t- talking about transcriptions and the register problem of transcriptions. And, you know, I'm, yeah. I'll work with a student on something and I, with the piano, and I just realize it just doesn't sound right. And why is oh, that? You realize, oh, you're right in the middle of the piano register. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. So you have to be careful with that. Even some of the, you know, like Mishek wrote a couple of sonatas. They sound quite a bit like Dvorak, mm-hmm. but they're good pieces. But the piano part is octaves in the bass register mm-hmm. and all that. You just have to be very careful in transcription. Mm-hmm. Um, this, this new book uh, I'm writing is, call, is going to be called Basses, comma, It's Too Loud. <laughs> nice. So, of course, everybody has encountered <laughs> that. Yep. And I got some stories from other bass players about... Uh, the moment in the orchestra where the conductor comes over and uh, some of them are pretty clever and they'll be based, uh, they're bass players that you know, a lot of us all know and friends. But, um, yeah, um, that's an issue. Mm-hmm. And uh, the other thing is I, I, I have a show on the 19th of March in the Museum of Making Music in Carlsbad, California, near up about a half an hour from my house. Okay. And it's in a series with John Clayton, with Victor Wooten, myself, and Katie Thoreau, who's a a nice-looking lady who sings and plays the bass in L.A. So um, I'm going to try to talk about... uh, A lot of people think uh, the uh, bass guitar is the bass. It's not a bass, it's a bass guitar. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, yep. and it's it's very good in a lot of the music uh, it plays, especially pop and rock music. I mean, my old student Nathan East has made it a very musical instrument. Has helped make it a very musical instrument. There are a lot of people like Steve Swallow and uh, one of the, Alfonso Johnson was. It? Marcus Miller was one. I don't know them all, but. Um, I have to explain to these people who are going to come to my concert that, uh, you know, this is not a bass. Don't confuse it with a bass. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's one of the issues right away. And I don't like upright bass. And uh, I don't like double bass. I'm, I'm 83 years old, so I can be a curmudgeon. It's okay. <laughs> I've, I've earned it, you know. Right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so that's what we do. But, uh, you know, I, I'm proud of my teaching. My stu- uh, Mark Dresser, Nathan, Kristen Gorb, uh, John Leftwich. Uh, I got the, a couple in, au- in Australia, and I got one in the Vienna Philharmonic, uh, principal in Hartford, the principal in Springfield, Massachusetts. There's just, uh, you know, I've been teaching a long time. There's many good ones, and there's many who have fallen by the wayside because it's very difficult, as you very well know, to sit in a small room with the big instrument and work things out. It's very lonely. You know, you have to really have a strong belief system to do that. You know, also, I was somehow, I inherited or developed, I don't know what, a sense of humor. I have a sense of humor about things. And um, a lot of people like it. And uh, when I play a concert, many of the people... Sometimes people come up and they say, we really like you and we know you're a master player. We didn't like all the music, but we just wanted to hear you perform. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I say, okay, thank you. Come back next time. Maybe you'll like the music a little better. And I, I honestly have said that many times. And, uh, you, you know, you're honest with them. And, uh, you know, a lot of people come out and they play, they're shucking and jiving, mm -hmm. and they don't believe what they're doing. And you can hear it. You know, you right. can hear it. Like some of the big time play, jazz players used to come out and it was a small town and they would say, ah, you know, I'm not going to knock myself out. I'll have a few more drinks than I should and uh, blah, 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 blah. And other guys come out and every time they play, no matter if they played it for 16 people, they just play their asses off and how great that is. Because you know that they love what they do and they believe in it and they want to give you a good performance because you paid the freight. I love that. I admire that. And I have so much respect for those people. You know, it's always New York. That's the way you play in New York or Chicago or L.A. And not the way you play in uh, Muskegee, Oklahoma, or Norwich, Connecticut, my hometown, which had about 35,000 people when I was last there. You, you play great as great as you can everywhere you go. You know, so mm -hmm. there you go. Well, I love the, the, the sense of humor. That just that, That's something that can be sorely lacking among any performers, but especially, like you were mentioning earlier, the, the contemporary music scene, that just having yeah. that and, uh, is, is so valuable. Well, it is, because you've got to communicate with the folks. Yeah. If they like you, they'll sit back in, in the seats and listen. So yesterday while I was doing the, the two uh, poetry pieces, about three or four people from the back of the room walked out the door. It was a free concert, so, you know, it's okay. They didn't like that. That pushed the idea of what they thought music was. Mm -hmm. And so I did my job, right? Yeah. I, I made them think about it for a split second, and they say, no, I don't like that. That's not what music is supposed to be, supposed to do. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. But the rest of them stayed. They had never heard anybody do that, I suspect. And they loved it. They were very warm. And uh, the people who put on the concert just were knocked out. Okay, that's good. I played a lot of famous performers. I played a, a lot of opera singers. They communicated with the audience. When they walked out, boy, everybody went wild. Franco Corelli, Anna Muffo. Wow. And then I played for a lot of, you know, singers and uh, dancers at summer Jewish summer resorts for 10 summers and uh, some guys would come out and they'd bomb and they were pretty good and others would be maybe mediocre but they know how to get to the audience mm -hmm. the audience really liked them and uh, they knew that they wanted to entertain them like uh, Gregory and Maurice Hines do you know that name Gregory yeah, Hines I, I do know the name uh. good Mm -hmm. uh, there they were wonderful dances, and I played them when they were kids, and they'd come up, uh, Jason, with three drum sets, one for their dad and one each for the boys. And, you know, the father was there as chaperone, and they would sing and they would dance. And sometimes then after the show, they'd come down to the room where I would be playing with the jazz trio after having played their show, and they'd say, uh, can we sing in on drums? Yeah. <laughs> Can we sing a tune? Of course. And they just love what they did. Yeah. And their father was just uh, there to make sure they didn't get in any trouble. And they did. They made pretty good careers, especially Greg. And Maurice, I think, is still alive. And uh, he was in Ain't Misbehaving. And um, he might be alive still. But, uh, you know, they love what they did. Whereas a lot of the black entertainers did because they were happy to have a job. For God's sakes, you know, 40, 50 years ago, mm -hmm. it was a very racialized, well, it's still a racialized, a racialized uh, situation. But that's the whole deal. I mean, if you're a performer, you perform. You don't just come out and play the music and say, you got to love this. No, I, no, we don't have to love it. If you play Bach in the style of Bruch, you know what the hell is that? Right. That's a mis that's a mistake. <laughs> yeah. You know, so uh, 
you you know people learn things and uh, uh, the more you learn I think uh, the better performer you are and the more you learn the more you realize you've got so much to to, to learn mm-hmm. and um, that's what makes the whole the whole journey as they say or the whole for me adventure uh, you know I had my coffee and I'm talking to you but before I talk to you before you called I was thinking about the next concert mm-hmm. uh, what pieces should I play this concert is the one I told you about that I have to explain about the bass and blah 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 give it a lot of history because John Clayton is going to play jazz Katie played jazz and Victor Wooten is going to do Victor Wooten which is going to be terrific mm-hmm. but uh, I have to show them where where the bass came from and maybe play a little bit of Dragonetti for them and play the solo from Othello and um, get someone out in the audience to play D A D A <laughs> and I'll play that that Mahler solo, yeah. you know, a, a, as a duo with an audience member and I hope they can keep time. <laughs> but I can jump around if they need and and then play a lot of different music and show what the instrument is, how versatile and uh, what did Fred Zimmerman say? A noble mm-hmm. but misunderstood instrument. Yeah. You know, I'll play the elephant and the cellist will play the swan and I'll say, see, it's rigged. <laughs> it's rigged. <laughs> and I'll tell him the story about the conductor who got mad at me when I played uh, the elephant elegantly like it had a, a pink tutu. Instead of, you know, sliding up the A string for that E flat. Yeah. Everybody sort of laughing. Oh, what a, you know, funny instrument. And uh, I couldn't do it. So he said, well, what does it do that for? You're supposed, the audience is supposed to laugh. I said, not at my expense and not at the expense of the instrument. You know, I could have played something like the Swan. Why does the cello get all the goodies? So he didn't like it. Dave Walter told me once he did it in Pittsburgh when he was principal and he played a Fritz Chrysler violin piece for the demonstration of the bass and Reiner didn't like it. Well, too bad. We have to show that the instrument is really something special and we have to fight for it. A lot of schools years ago didn't insist you play a recital. Yeah, that's Come amazing. On. I can't, that's, it is yeah. amazing. And the Manhattan School was one of those, you know, years and years ago, but they didn't require you at a jury, and then you were out. No, you can't do that. And uh, I played at the Claremont Festival five summers, and so a very nice director and conductor said, uh, blah, blah, and we're going to, so-and-so is going to play this concerto, and cellist is going to play this. And I said, what would you like me to do? He said, what? I said, well, if they're going to play solo pieces, I should have a solo piece. After all, I'm your bass faculty. <laughs> huh. So what would you play? So I told them, oh, at that time, I think I told them David Baker's concerto for bass, big band, string quartet, flute quartet, and horn quartet placed all around the room in quad, you know, like live quad. Yeah. Nice. And it was it tore the place up. It tore the place up, and uh, some of the other faculty were pissed off. I said, "Look, you played the viola concerto of Hindemith, uh, and uh, you played the cello concerto, and the violinist plays the violin concerto, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And I said, "This was the concerto I wanted to play." People seemed to like it, except the very traditional faculty didn't like it at all. <laughs> Too bad. Of noogies, you know, uh, you got to get the instrument out there. Uh, I I see um, I see a lot of people playing recitals. The year I did my debut in '64 in New York City, there was only a, one other uh, bass recital uh, in New York City that year. Now that's crazy, Jason. Yeah, that's no crazy. Kidding. Wow, you know. So, I mean, we've come a long way, and technically, we conceptually, we've come a long way, and the instruments are set up better than they used to be, and the strings are better, right? Oh, yeah. And all, and all that. So, 
times are changing, and uh, uh, you know, before I, uh, what do they say? What do they say? Before I, well, I, before I leave the planet, uh, I, I look back and I say, all this stuff is happening, and at least I had a little part in inspiring some of the mischief that, that's going on now. And I like that. Well, yeah, you were like the the pioneer for all this. It's just exciting to see the, what's what's even been happening the last twenty years. But I mean, Absolutely. going back to that that sixty four day. I mean, how many years ago is that now? It's yeah, it's yeah. a long time. <laughs> so, now you yeah. you mentioned you mentioned you you have read a lot and read a lot of memoirs. And I, I, are there any books in particular that you think have really shaped you as a musician? No, not not books. Uh, people, people, uh, people have uh, shaped me. Uh, the, my three teachers: uh, uh, Iadone, Marx, David Walter, um, and then you're in Chicago. The late Warren Benfield, mm -hmm, of course, he was a wonderful friend to me, and he believed in me. And on his book, he thought that Gary Carr and I were the guys, and I thought. God be mentioned with Gary, who's a friend. Uh, that's very nice. And we were basically operating at exact opposite poles. Mm -hmm. He was playing the, the commercial, pardon me, that's not a slur, but he was playing, you know, the traditional stuff, that's better. And uh, I was coming out of new music and saying, look, there's a, another side to this wonderful instrument that has many, many voices like the Sarangi, for example, you know, 100 voices in it, and I was just trying to find them all. So, um, yeah, some people say, oh, he's the godfather. But look, I get a kick out of um, on my birthday, which is, you know, has passed. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm a Valentine guy. And Nathan East always sends something, a card or a letter to me, and he... And, um, uh, I have a, an old fr high school friend who was a talented musician, became a lawyer, lives in Chicago. And uh, Jim um, and I connected a few years ago, and then he, he wrote me a letter. He said, I went to hear Herbie Hancock, and the bass player was Nathan East. Mm -hmm. And they had the biogs of the players, and he mentioned studying with you at the University of California. And he said, I didn't know that. I said, well, he did study with me, and I encouraged him. In fact, the story, is, I don't know if I wrote it in the book, but he came up and he said he wants to talk about graduate school. And wow. I said, let's not talk about graduate school. <laughs> Go to L.A., become world famous, make, become famous, and earn a lot of money and make us proud, especially to make us proud. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, you're, you're kidding. I said, no, you know. What the the only thing that was problem for him at first was reading, and he even told me that when he came back and saw me uh, a couple of years later, uh, he was not a great reader, but his ear was so fast that you know on the, the second time around uh, he had it, or he was maybe off by a second, and uh, so he's not a dear friend. They did a he did a show uh, at the university and. Uh, the guy who put the show on said that Bert, Nate wants you to play in the concert with him. So I said, what would I play with him? So he said, don't ask me, just come and play. I said, okay. And he was just a sweetheart. Uh, Mark Dresser also played, who was my student and took my job. And um, so it was, uh, you know, it was very nice. And you, all these people who have done well, are very sweet, and I hear from them all the time. And uh, to, uh, I mean, I have respect because I'm from the other generation. When you grew up, you had respect for good teachers and mm -hmm. people who cared about you. You always did. But a lot of people today, that, you know, I took some lessons with him. <laughs> you know, you got to respect knowledge and you got to respect uh, people who have opened doors for other people. And, um, you never get anywhere just as a solo act. You know, someone always helped you, right? Mm -hmm, Even if it was your mom. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. They showed you how to wipe your nose or something. And so on. Um, I see a lot of interesting things happening. And um, I see some music and I see my hand in some of it. 
But that's not important. What's important is people are playing, people are writing. There's a, a young bass player at UCSD that Mark Dresser's working with. Uh, he's terrific. I mean, really, he's going to be a world beater. And his name is Matt Klein, mm-hmm. a K-L-I-N-E. And I think it's going very well. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, it's exciting. I look at all these former students of yours, like Kristen and Mark and yeah. Nathan, and they're, these are people that I just think of as open. I I've, know a few of them, at least personally, and open-minded people and involved in music and in really different ways. So it's kind of cool how you've sent all these different students off into really different areas of the music world. Well, that's, isn't that, you don't want to look. Uh, that uh, there's uh, some teachers who say, oh, you come in for a, a coaching session, and then all of a sudden there's a, a phrase, and they say, no, 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 no. Play it like me. Oh, <laughs> that's the death now. Don't play it like me. What, what does the phrase mean in the context of the piece? And if you understand that, then you'll know how to play it. And maybe the next time you play it uh, Sul D or something like that. And uh, then you grow. But if you make everybody try to sound like a, uh, uh, a Bert Turetsky, it'd be a mistake. One of my students, who I, I really like him, he, he's got a curious career, but it's in music. And um, he um, once went in, in a lesson, and he said, um, he finished a phrase, and he said, how do you like the Bert Turetsky vibrato? And I said, don't you ever do that again in a menacing tone of voice. (laughs) And he said, well, what what did I do wrong? I said, I don't want you to imitate me. I don't want you to be the best Joe you can be. Mm -hmm. But the best Joe you can be is not imitating me. No, don't do that again, because if you do it, no more lessons. (laughs) Bye-bye. And he said, you're serious? I I said, of course I'm serious. I want you to find your own voice and go with it. And he understood. Mm-hmm. He never did it again. And uh, he's a good friend. But that's what you do. One other thing, uh, I think I've published more Dragonetti than any living bass player. Yeah. And a lot of people think, oh, he's the crazy guy who plays the crazy music. No. I'm a scholarly guy who plays a wide range of music. And uh, uh, Theodore Presser published uh, an arrangement of medieval music that I did for piccolo, alto, flute, and bass. Um, Madrigals by Jacopo de Bologna, who flourished in 1350. And I have uh, books of quartets and trios that when I have time, uh, I'm going to publish. So, you know, I want well-rounded musicians uh, who can do things, and they'll make a life in music. And, if, if you know, they all went different ways, and I think that's great. And Kristen is writing a bit, and um, she made some nice, interesting arrangements with different meters. Mark got his own sound. I saw him um, on the 15th. And um, there's a tradition, some of the friends and former students uh, take uh, Nance and I to dinner to an Indian place, and we have a nice time every year about this, about my birthday time. Yeah. And Mark was there, and he said, you know, I first met you when I was 17, and we're still friends. Remarkable. I mean, that's worth everything, right? Oh, Yeah. It's just amazing yep. to me to watch. Uh, I, it, you you haven't let up. <laughs> you've got a you've got an amazing just what you're continuing to contribute to the to the field with you know this new book and now you you're working on this third book and yep. performances and it's just it's it's really inspiring to see uh, the path that you forge and continue to forge. I'm just well, thank you yeah. for that. I I'm a workaholic. Yeah, uh, you know you can tell that. <laughs> There you have it, folks. My conversation from back uh, end of 2015, early 2016, that sort of time frame with Bert Turetsky. So great to chat with Bert. And I think that this is just one of those 
episodes that's just evidence of this sort of living oral history that this podcast is. That's not the only purpose or intent of this podcast, but it really is that in a sense. And as you'll see with some of these other upcoming episodes, the sort of advantage of chatting with all sorts of people about similar topics. It just lends us some really interesting possibilities. I'm going to be putting out the complete winning the audition. I put that out as four episodes in 2016. I'm going to synthesize it all together so you can listen to the whole thing without clicking around or that kind of thing. And there's also one that I'm going to be putting out in this couple weeks of greatest hits all about Paul Ellison, including my interview with Paul, as well as student perspectives on what Paul is like as a teacher. That's only scratching the surface of what you can do with this medium, but I really hope you enjoyed that. If you listened to Halloween episode, I hope you enjoyed that. If you want a little bit of fun and a great story from James Vandermark, go back and listen to that. It's episode 420. Thanks for tuning in. We will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. <laughs>